And here we are coming to you live from our top secret frozen broadcasting bunker here in Anchorage, Alaska, Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I am alive today. We barely made it. Um, I showed a little uh, security camera shot uh, in the, the pre-broadcast time before, we, uh, before I actually started talking. Uh, we are getting freezing rain and sleet as we speak uh, right here. And it start, get, started getting pretty bad this morning as we were coming into town. And uh, before I came into the church, I had to run Sweetie Pie over here and over there and up yonder and back over here again. And we were it, it was starting to get pretty bad. Uh, we actually had somebody who was planning on coming on their way uh, to visit us this weekend, and they said, nah, nah, not going to do it. Okay, so I, I think they turned around and went back home. Uh, but it's getting, getting, pretty, uh, getting pretty interesting outside. Somebody sent me a piece of paper for today that I'm just, I am stunned, and I will tell you, when I tell you what this piece of paper is, you will find out the fix is in. The fix is you know the fix. They're going to fix everybody. It's kind of like what they do to dogs. Take your dog to the vet so he can get fixed. He's not broke. Now, everything works. If you ask me, you take the dog to the vet so he can get broken, but not fixed. That's the same concept. Now you're taking, now it's not your dog going to the veterinarian. It's your child going to the pediatrician. And I'm telling you, the fix is in. I was, I was stunned at this uh, years and years ago when my wife has me accompany her to take our little darling children to the pediatrician. And um, I, I don't know, he was, a, he was a member of a Baptist church here in town. We would talk about the Bible a lot. I think he's a nice guy. I don't know where his orders came from, but all of a sudden, we have our darling, darling, lovely little girl children at the pediatrician, and he's asking them, he's asking them, are there any guns in your house? I'm going, why? Are you out of ammo or what? Do, do you have any guns in your house? Are they put away? Do they have safety locks on them? Can you have access to these weapons? And I'm just going, what are you doing? That's none of your, that is none of your business. This, and there's some stuff right there. And some of you, they, and your family thinks you're crazy. Your family thinks that you're nuts because you don't like to take your kids to the doctor. And your family's going, what are you hiding? Huh? What do you got? What are you doing? Why don't you take them to the doctor? What are you afraid of? Huh? You're afraid of getting turned in. For nothing. Why are you afraid of getting turned in? Listen to this. Uh, and I'm not going to give, I don't have the email pulled up, so I won't inadvertently read the name of the lady that sent me this. Uh, but she's, this she just got today when she took her child to the pediatrician. They, they had to fill out this form. And she was not given the first page to the form. It's actually like one, two, three pages or something like that. Here is what the first page says. This is the, I'll show you the, the pa paper here. Bright Futures. Think, look at the logo. One, two, three, four, five, six rays. Tools for professionals. Instructions for use. This is the pediatric symptom checklist. Pediatric symptom checklist. You would expect things like, is there a repetitive cough? Are they feeling like pain around their jaw area? Do they have a runny nose? Are they not able to see very well? You think things like that are on there. Let me read the instructions to the professional of this pediatric checklist. By the way, I, I'm going to go through this, and uh, I'm going to go back over some of the information that we were covering on Tiwi's Day. Because if you remember, somebody had asked some good questions um, uh, about Bible interpretation, and I don't, I don't know exactly 
how much everybody heard. Um, we had a we had a problem with the feed, and then we had uh, I, I and my backup is the recording. I thought ah feed schmeed. If something's wrong with the feed, then I've got the, the I've got the recording. We'll just post that on sermon audio, and everything in the whole world would be a better place. And when I got ready, I got done with it. I talked for another hour after nobody could see me. I'm just living in La La Land here. And when I checked the recording, there's nothing there. Just an hour's worth of the of the show. And I went, ugh. So anyway, I'm going to go back over some of that material because someone emailed me Tuesday. And what they said to me was, you don't rightly divide the Bible you are in a lie. And I asked the simple question. Show me where or show me where I'm wrong in not rightly dividing it. And then show me the rules from the Bible on how I'm supposed to rightly divide it. Uh, so I mentioned that several times, but of course... <laughs> There was nobody listening, and nobody after that was listening. Uh, so I sent, I wrote the guy an email back. Uh, I have, unless I'm missing it, I have not seen a response uh, from this person. So I tweeted, and the little bird said, if you know how to do this, if you know how to rightly divide, show it to me. Send me an email. So that was, uh, I don't know, about 30, 45 minutes ago. And um, so anyway, I, I am, and you know what? I am being, I'm being realistic and I'm being serious. I'm not being sarcastic here. I'm not just looking to set somebody up uh, so that when you write in, I go, ah, I catch ya. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I have a very high regard for scripture. I have a very high regard for truth. And I have a high regard toward those people who say, Mike, we believe the King James Bible. We believe it's true, and we believe that you are in error because of some things that you're saying. I get it. I respect that. And so I am not looking to go on the attack. What I'm wanting to do, um, and I, I, mentioned this, I mentioned this Tuesday, but again, I don't, I don't think anybody heard me. Um, I mentioned I was in contact with someone over the weekend. I'm not going to say their name. They are a pastor, and they were aware of the attacks um, and the and the accusations that I have been receiving. And I asked them, "Can I can I ask you some questions and and it not affect our friendship?" He said, "Absolutely, absolutely." And by the way, he did not like how there was people, you wouldn't believe what was coming out of Christians' mouth. By the way, I'm like 90% sure that some of those people are listening right now because that's what they do. They listen to just about everything that I do and say in hopes that they can catch something. It's like the lady down in Florida who went through hours of my videos waiting for me to point to heaven like this. You know, just, I, I don't know what I was saying. I was out in the church floor and I was preaching something, probably saying something about God and, you know, hey, go to heaven or what. And she put that on her website as I was making the Illuminati hand gesture like like it's in the da vinci code and i was flashing i'm not making this up i tease everybody because you know i'll show like you know certain hand gestures things like that and i'm going somebody's going to get a clip of that and make it look like i'm flashing a sign to my illuminati brethren secretly because i'm on their side and that's what she somebody has actually done this so that's, I, I know that people are out there listening and waiting for me to say something, and then they can go, see, wolf in sheep's clothing, it's false prophet. So we welcome you to the program, and you're, you're more than welcome to write in and say whatever you want to say today. Today is your day. 
okay? But tomorrow's not looking real good for you, all right? But anyway, uh, be, be thinking about that. If, um, if, you would like to, um, if you'd like to send me some scriptures on Rightly Dividing, I'm looking forward to, to seeing it. This is the Pediatric Symptom Checklist. The pediatric, this is the instructions for the professional. The pediatric symptom checklist is a psychosocial screen. Psychosocial. I know people who are like that. Okay? Whenever they get around people, they're psycho. All right? Is a psychosocial screen designed to facilitate the recognition of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral problems so that appropriate interventions, the appropriate interventions on the part of the healthcare professional, there really is only one appropriate intervention for most healthcare, healthcare professionals in this nation, and that is, uh, yeah, Child Abuse Hotline, we got one for you. Oh, yeah, this is bad. Yep, bad. Dad's got a gun at home. Need to send somebody out right now. While I got him at the office, send somebody out. Uh, so the interventions can be initiated as early as possible. Included here are two versions, the parent-completed version and the youth self-report. In other words, they're going to ask the child, how does, how does it make you feel? The YPSC can be administered to adolescents age 11 and up. The, uh, the test consists of 35 items that are rated as never, sometimes, or often, and, and so on. And then it kind of tells you how to score it and so on. Let me, sh let me read to you the youth report. Here's what your doctor is going to ask your, your precious children. Number one, complain of aches and pains. Number two, do you spend more time alone? Number, and, and when they say never, sometimes, or often, if that child puts often, oh, I wonder why. I wonder why they do. Is it because your parents are doing drugs? Is that it? Huh? You can tell us. Number three, tire easily, little energy. Number four, fidgety, unable to sit still. Five, have trouble with teacher. Oh, my goodness. I had trouble with my teacher. Consistently. Uh, less interested in school. Act as if driven by a motor. Daydream too much. Distract easily. Are afraid of new situations feel sad, unhappy, are irritable, angry, feel hopeless. What has that got to do with <coughs> have trouble concentrating, less interested in friends, fight with other children, absent from school, school grades dropping, down on yourself, visit doctor with doctor finding nothing wrong, have trouble sleeping, worry a lot, want to be with parent more than before, feel that you are bad, take unnecessary, see, this, stop right here. Do you feel that you're bad? And so the child would score often. And so the doctor is going, hmm, I bet it's because there is a parent in the house that's telling them they're bad. Yeah, that's what it is. I bet they're I bet they're abusing them. I bet they're telling them things. I bet I bet the Hey, child abuse. We got one. Yeah, come on out of here. Take unnecessary risks, get hurt frequently, seem to be having less fun. <laughs> that's like half of my day. Act younger than children your age. Right here. Do not listen to rules. Do not show feelings. Do not understand other people's feelings. Right here. Tease others. Yep. Blame others for your troubles. Oh, yeah. 
Take things that do not belong to you. Nah. Refuse to share. Not true. Because I offered over the intercom the rice portion of my Chinese food. Boy, I miss that. Because rice turns to sugar. And I can't have it no more. It's a psych, it's a psych test. A, a social psycho analysm. They're not, they don't care about their blood work. They don't care about the green snot running down their nose. They don't care about anything like that. We have to intervene. These children are being abused. They're being neglected by their right-wing fundamentalist parents who spank them and make them feel as if they can never do anything right. We need the government to intervene on behalf of those children and pull them out of that house so that they never attend that fundamentalist church ever again. You know what? Here, you can keep that. Lynette comes in here and says, Hey, Pastor, I got your back. Okay? Uh, I tell my people all the time, Hey, I'm behind you all the way, people. And old Roy turns around and says, yeah, is that why your foot is my, in my backside all the time? Yeah, Roy, that's probably right. Uh, let's see here. Let's see something related to that. Government monitoring. NSA tracking cell phone locations worldwide. Snowden documents show. The National Security, National Insecurity Agency is gathering nearly five. Listen to this. The NSA is gathering five billion records a day on the whereabouts of these self oh I got a text sorry my attention is a little bit deficit ah better fill that one out okay um, anyway, 5 billion records a day, the whereabouts of cell phones around the world, according to top secret documents and interviews with U.S. unintelligence officials, enabling the agency to track the movements of individuals and map their relationships in ways that would have been previously unimaginable. And I want you to get this. You walk around with this GPS locator device on you all the time. Every place you go. It's got to be charged up. It's got to be accessible. It's got to be on. The data plan has to be working and syncing with everybody in the world. <clears throat> and a record. The moment, that it, let's just follow you throughout the day. <clears throat> you get up in the morning. And you turn your cell phone on if you turned it off the night before. Turn it on in the morning and you put it in your purse, your pocket, or whatever it is, and you leave. And you're driving. And the NSA is, is keeping a record of who you passed on the road, how many people you went by. And then you, then you stop at a place. Let's say you stop at the gas station and you get, you know, your, your morning beverage or whatever it is. Or you go to McDonald's and get, get some poison from McDonald's. And then, and then all the people that are around there, you, you were in the same room with them. And then they, they don't think, well, you know, you're at McDonald's, so obviously you don't know anybody there. That's not necessarily true because then they'll take the people that were there at the McDonald's at that time, and then they start checking the past to see if you have ever went by this person before. Or maybe you texted them. Or maybe you made a phone call to them. Or maybe... You messaged them on Facebook, or maybe you had already set it up previously to meet that person at McDonald's at that time. And they know it. Their computer system, their algorithms, know it. Know exactly. You know this person. You've met before. You've talked it. You, set, you texted. You set the meeting up. And they know this. Five billion records each and every day of how everybody moves and interacts with everybody else in the world. That's power, people. That's power over the people, people, is what that is. And 
We live in this little la-la land that says, well, they're, they're not interested in me because I'm not a, uh, a Middle Eastern terrorist. They're not, they're, uh, they're just looking to see maybe, you know, who they might catch. Knowledge is power. And power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Do you really think the benevolent people who sit behind in the cubicles monitoring all this information are simply just naive and they have no agenda? It's already come out. Snowden or somebody already, already was telling everybody that's how one of the guys that he worked with was picking up chicks. You know, like little baby chickens. That's how he was doing it. Uh, what else was there? There was another article. This is, I think, was on uh, Drudge Reporter somewhere. TSA expands searches of parked cars at airports. When we went to pick up Lynette at the airport, we got ready to get, we parked at the airport parking garage. We got ready to get out of the car, and Lisa said, oh, hang on. She pulls out her revolver, and I'm going, she hit it. I won't say where. She hit it in the vehicle, locked it up. I said, oh, yeah, we don't want to be going into the airport with a loaded weapon. They're searching the cars in the lot. TSA approved warrantless searches of vehicles parked outside airports. Wait a minute. I'm parked outside of an airport right now, are being expanded with a photograph taken at Birmingham Shuttlesworth International Airport, informing Thanksgiving travelers that all vehicles belonging to Ameripark customers will be searched by uniform security. Here's the sign. Right there. All cars will be searched by uniform security. It's mandated by the FAA and TSA. Is that FAA or BAA? The uh, the policy, which first came to light earlier this summer after complaints from people w who found notes inside their car, which read, your vehicle has been inspected under TSA regulations, continues to cause confusion and stoke concern amongst privacy. That, that makes me mad. For the mere, for the mere incident of you parking your car because you have to go get on a plane somewhere, they think they have a right to snoop and sniff through your car. They don't. The Constitution says that is an illegal search and or seizure of your person and your effects. They have no business doing that. I think they have no business doing that. When the story first broke, the TSA was keen to deflect responsibility by explaining that although, quote, the plan is approved by the TSA, it is up to each airport authority and its state and local law enforcement partners to follow the plan that has been implemented. A sign above, originally posted by Young Americans for Liberty, suggests that airport, uh, airport uniformed security guards are responsible for carrying out the searches at Birmingham International, not valet parking staff. The image was taken November 27th, day after Thanksgiving, and one of the busiest travel days of the year. At some airports, the searches are also being conducted with customers receiving no notification whatsoever. I was inside paying my bill. I looked through the window and saw this gentleman looking through my trunk, said Michelle Zavola, who used the curbside valet service at Charlotte Douglas Airport. He was moving things around, shining a flashlight, going through compartments. I'm so fine being searched at the airport. It's about safety, but I'm not fine with my personal property being searched without permission or notification, added Zavola. There is no posted signage at the valet sign or around the airport that indicates cars left with curbside service will be searched. There is also no warning on the back of the valet ticket, reported uh, NBC Charlotte. Deputy Aviation Director Jack Christine admitted that the searches had been taking place for a year, a year and a half, without any signage or notification. Uh, let's see here. There was another one. Here is how, the, this is from the Washington Post, how the NSA 
is tracking people right now. Uh, documents obtained by the Washington Post indicate the National Security Insecurity Agency is collecting billions of records a day to track the location of mobile phones around the world. The NSA collects this location and travel habit data to do what's called target development to find unknown associates of targets it already knows about. To accomplish this, the NSA compiles information. Lynette, when you came to Festus, the NSA put us all together. See, your phone and my phone, and yours is ringing, your phone and my phone in the same area together, and they're going, aha, uh -oh. those libertarians and those republicans are meeting together. Aha, got it. Yeah, we're, we're on to you, fella. To accomplish, uh, yeah, they compile information on a vast database of devices and their locations. Most of those collected, by definition, are suspected of no wrongdoing. Wait a minute. If we're suspected of no wrongdoing, what happened to what was called, what they used to call that back in the old days, back in the, back in the 90s, back in the old days, probable cause. Probable, see, those words, pro, you've heard those words, probable cause? in the Constitution without probable cause or due cause. It's in there. There is no due cause for the government to be able to know that my cell phone and Lynette's cell phone and Sweetie Pie's cell phone were all in the same building together. It's none of their business. Using these vast location databases, the NSA applies sophisticated analytics techniques to identify what it calls co-travelers, unknown associates who might be traveling with or meeting up with a known target. Here's how it works. Uh, and it, I'd, I'd encourage you to get the article. It's very, very interesting. Um, Cell phone tower, cell tower coverage leaves few places to hide. I mean, you've seen the, like the Verizon map. See, AT&T and Verizon uh, and T-Mobile, they're bragging about their coverage. Okay? And now we can look at it and say, there really is no place to hide in America. No place to hide. Mobile devices, mobile phones, smartphones, Wi-Fi signals, GPS receivers, on and on and on and on. You know what a ping is? A ping, actually, the guys who developed computers years ago, they were, they were trying to do what was called a handshake. First time guys were getting together trying to hook this computer in with this computer. They developed a protocol that used, and I think this is interesting, it's used what's called a handshake, okay? Somebody's going to get a clip of that right there, okay? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's amazing. He's in with his self. Anyway, so they do what was called an electronic handshake. This computer reaches out with a certain protocol, a certain code. This computer, upon receiving the code, says, hi. How you doing? We're brethren. All right? Let's talk. So, if this computer wanted to find another computer that maybe it was out there on the network somewhere, this computer would do what, you know, what, what we do when we play ping pong. It would hit a ball. That's the ping. And the computer would send out a ping, and if the other computer was on the network, it would receive the ping and send back a pong. And so that's what they're doing. Cell phone towers are constantly pinging your phone. Ping! And your phone goes, oh, wait, here's a ping. And the phone goes, pong, and it sends back this little packet. Okay? This little packet's in this little wrapper, and I'm using... Techno language wrappers is a uh, W R A P P E R. It's a it's a terminology used in networking. Okay, it sends out this little package with a wrapper around it, and the wrapper 
uh, is sent through the wires, and the other computer receives it and says, oh, let's open up and see what's in the package. And it opens it up, and oh, look, they're at Walmart. Wow. Let's go see what they're buying. Let's go see because we got cameras now under the shelves, and you see a little advertisement coupon flash up, or they've got these monitors, these little TV screens everywhere like at Walmart, and you walk by, and all of a sudden, you're saying, I wonder where the mayonnaise is. And all of a sudden, there's a lady on the monitor going, Hellman's Real Mayonnaise, a dollar off today. And you're just going, okay, that's weird. But you see, now, all of the connectivity that's going on, now the NSA knows that when they pinged you, that you were in Walmart, that you were looking for mayonnaise. I wonder why they were looking for mayonnaise. I wonder if they found out how to make a mayo bomb. Ooh. Knowledge is power, people. Knowledge is power. So you know what? I say we ought to have counterintelligence. Counterintelligence. You know what that and you know what that means on the Christian side? Right here. Counterintelligence. Because I really don't think that you and I will ever, 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 ever ever get invited to the Bilderberg meeting. I don't think it's going to happen. Been checking the mail now every day for my invite and hadn't got it yet. But I don't need it. I don't need to go to the meeting. I don't need for them to say, now, Hoggard, we invited you here because we're going to tell you what our secret plans are, but you can't tell anybody. We don't want you to say a word. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I don't need it. I've got a Bible. The entrance of thy words giveth light. And all I need is to just read the scriptures. All you need is to read la scriptures, which is Spanish for the scriptures all you need. Just read it. Read it and read it and then read it some more and then read it again. And then all of a sudden you're going to read something. You go, wait a minute. Something just, something just occurred to me. And you go flipping through pages and you find, and you go, oh, look at that. They're saying the same thing. None shall want her mate. And you get all excited and giddy. And, and that's how God does it. That's how he shows us what is in the pages of this absolutely amazing, amazing book. I asked you to send me some emails, okay, on how to rightly divide. Um, I, I sent the guy from Tuesday, I sent him an email because I didn't figure he heard the rest of the broadcast, I, I, uh, I, I sent him an email asking him to please respond. And I was respectful. I said, respectfully, please um, show me how, you know what? Maybe I can find his email. Hang on here. Where is it? Right. Is it there, 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 there. No, no, no. Did it even send out? Hang on here. Well, maybe I didn't. I thought I wrote him one. Hang on here. Let me check this folder here. No, 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 no. Oh, well. Hey, hey, guy out there that sent me an email, send me another one. Okay, maybe he's watching. I don't know. Here is, uh, you know what? I will read this one. Uh, this is, now. I, I won't. I won't say the name. Uh, this is in response to what I was saying a while ago about the pediatrician. Hi, Pastor Mike. Several years ago, I took my teen daughter to the pediatrician. There was an intern there that day. It was a clinic. Anyway, she asked me to leave the room so she could talk to her privately. I don't think so. Uh, I was not as discerning as I am now. I wasn't reading the KJV either, but my daughter was good back then and told me everything. I can't remember, but she did ask her things about sexuality. 
I guess, to see if she needed birth control. My daughter was, I think, 14 at the time. I couldn't believe it. Her regular doctor didn't do this. But I remember leaving thinking they were trying to make sure my daughter wasn't being abused or something. It angered me. Made sure I never met with an intern again. And I, I listen, people, I'm just telling you, you, some of you out there are scared to death that your child is going to, children fall and break stuff. I have broken this wrist three places coming off the slide at school, first grade, okay? I have uh, dislocated both elbows. Uh, I have injured my ribs. I have had teeth chipped, knocked out of place, um, scars, damages, you name it, galore. Fingers broke, all of which as a child, not one time was any of it anybody's fault but mine. But nowadays, you are scared to death. Not as some weirdo driving up and down the street. Although, yeah, you should be scared of that. You are scared to death that your child is going to sustain some sort of injury. And you're going to have to take it to the hospital. And you've got some explaining to do, ma'am. What happened here? It looks like to me that this child might have been abused. And you are scared. You are scared to death to take your child in. And I'll just say this. I don't, I don't have the law in front of me. <laughs> Couldn't read it if I had it. I don't have the Obamacare law in front of me. I don't have any evidence. I just got a sneaking suspicion because I know how it works. I think that there is right now either something in the Obamacare law or something that will be developed into the Obamacare system that will provide for a rapid intervention of any child in this country based upon you're not political correct enough. You're not doing it the right way. You're not, you said, did you say those words to your child? Your child's gone. Your child is ours now. I think that we can see it coming. But I do. I think some of you guys are absolutely scared to death of your child getting hurt or sick because the doctors or the interns are going to nail you for it. You didn't do anything wrong. All they have to do, all they have to do is find out that you either raised your voice to your child or you actually used correction on your child. That's all they have to do. And see, these doctors like to hide behind this, well, I'm a mandatory reporter. Of course, i got to call this in. I've been with these guys who had an agenda. As soon as you walk in the door, they think they've got you pegged. So anyway, um, you know what? Trying to make this interesting here, uh, hoping you'd write in, and I've got like five emails from four people. The email, you know what, maybe, I, maybe that's why. Maybe I didn't put the email address on there, and you just flat forgot it. So here is the email address, Pastor Mike Online. This is the talk show that hell and a few others hate. Ah, ah. I'm getting emails. Let's uh, kind of work our way up here, and I will get to you guys shortly. Uh, uh, lady who sent the email in about your daughter, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I almost, almost said your name. I almost said your name, your address, phone number, and social security number, and what you paid in taxes. I almost said that over the, over the air, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't. Uh, let's hear. Johan sent me this. Let me see if I can plop this up on the screen. Uh, it's, let me see if I can, oh yeah, let me try that. Let me try that. I can flip that booger around here. No, I can't do that. He sent me a sidewards picture. He said, Pastor Mike, you got to look at this. A sidewards picture of 
how they sell Dan Brown's book, The Illuminati, in Germany. And I, I will say, I think it's good mark. Well, it's marketing. All right, it's what it is. So they're selling Dan Brown's book, The Illuminati, uh, in Germany for six six point six six euros. Was that done on purpose? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it was done on purpose. Okay, uh, what was the purpose in it? Well. More than likely, it was for it was to get you, get your attention. Ooh, the Illuminati book, and it's six euros and sixty six. What are they have pennies, cents? I don't know. Anyway, never used a euro before. Uh, so anyway, Johan, I appreciate that. Natalie sends me a says salvation question, and Natalie says, I came from a Southern Baptist church in Northern Michigan. No, I'm just, I made that up. A Southern Baptist church who used the New American Standard Bible until God really got a hold of me and taught me that the KJV is his word. I'm still kind of baffled at the repercussions of those who don't use the KJV. Many of my old fellow churchgoers read their Bible daily, appeared to really live for Christ, share the gospel, had the same doctrine except for belief on KJV, which I don't think they have ever even thought about, and repent of their sins. I guess I'm pondering the thought that it can only be Christ that leads us to repentance and to salvation. Can you please give me some insight on this? Yes, I will. Let's talk about salvation. Let's, let's talk about that, and I'm going to try. You're, you're asking me, are these people saved? I mean, are, are they going to heaven? I can't say that. I can't say it. You can't say it. The Southern Baptist denomination can't say it. Only God can say it. Only God can say, so-and-so is saved. So-and-so is mine. I had them on the list before the foundation of the world. Only God can say that. Okay. Now, the person is going to have an earnest of the inheritance, which is the seal. That's, that's in the, the book of Ephesians, which is his Holy Spirit. Are you following with me? The Holy Spirit, in fact, let me read that. Get your Bibles out. Open your uh, fresh can. Somebody, somebody was asking the other day, I wonder what really is in that can. Milk and honey, I'm telling you, okay? Um, Ephesians, you know what? I'll do it like this. Let me uh, put the software up on the screen here. Move it over like that, and I'll do that, and I'll do, let me get rid of, this here, the email address is pastormikeonline at gmail.com, and let's do this, okay? Let's type in, because I know that there is a verse in, and I'm obviously not spelling it right, E-A-R-N-E-S-T, all right? There's a verse in Ephesians that gives us an idea of how you personally can know that you're saved. So he says here, and let's go up to, let's get the, the context. Let's walk circumspectly around this one verse here that we're going to look at, because that is what the Bible says. See that you walk circumspectly. So let's circumspect around this verse. So the Bible says, uh, let's go up here to verse 11. Uh, let's see. What did I do? Ah, I do that all the time. I go... I, I scrolled up too far. Uh, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. In other words, we already, those who are truly born again, already have the inheritance in their name. It's like a reservation. We don't have it physically in our hands yet, but it's reserved in heaven for us. That's what the Bible says being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, 
After that ye heard, watch this. Now look at this phrase here. After that ye heard what? The word of truth. What does that mean? Well, it means the Bible. The Bible is, and you know, let's just apply Bible terms here. Jesus said, thy word is truth. What word? Genesis, that's truth. Ecclesiastes, yeah, that's truth. Isaiah, yeah, that's truth. Hebrews, that's truth. Revelation, sure it is. Matthew, it's all true. So you and I heard the word of, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that someone upon hearing, let's say that I was going to preach Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was that form of void and darkness. Of, and by the way, the earth did not become without form and void. It was without form and void. It's what, it's what the Bible says. It was, was without form and void. I could preach Genesis chapter 1. Do you think someone could respond to that preaching and say, you know what? I, that is the opposite of what I heard in school. And I don't know, the Holy Ghost is just convicting me right now, and I want to give my life to the creator of this universe. I want to be saved by him. I want to know him. Oh, yeah. Did you know that you can, when, if you, you can, you know, I might do this one day on the PMO. You could study the, the account of the creation in Genesis chapter 1 and see how God creates a clean heart. What, what was it David said? Create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. He used the word create. How does God create? Go back to Genesis 1. When a person is in sin, they're without form and voidless, and, there's, and they're without form and void, and darkness is upon the face of the deep, and there is no light, and then God says, let there be light. And then God starts doing things. He divides the light from dark. He starts showing you right and wrong. And that whole thing of the creation week is a process of how God leads someone to Jesus. So it's the word of truth. And then, let's go back to the screen here. Then he says, um, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Where's the gospel at? Where's the gospel message? Well, it's in Genesis, it's in Exodus, it's in Leviticus, it's in Numbers, it's in the Psalms, it's in Isaiah. The more you think about it, the more you look, you'll be able to find the gospel in the whole Bible. The gospel of your salvation, in whom, ye also, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Is there a condition of salvation? Paul said, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Remember, back up here, we have obtained an inheritance, but we don't physically have the inheritance in our hand yet. So what do we have? We have, let's see here, the earnest of our inheritance, which is that Holy Spirit of what? Promise. What are, what is, what does that mean? The promises are the promises that God made in his word. And if you, I mean, if you think I'm taking any of this out of context, what I'm doing is I'm, as I'm going through this, I'm thinking of other scriptures that apply to this. Like the, after that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. What is the word of truth? Jesus said, thy word is truth. So unless you can show me from the scriptures where something from the Bhagavad Gita uh, is truth, then when the Bible refers to after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, then that means the Bible. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know that it matters what part of the Bible. But you hear, how, can they, how, did, how did God choose to save people? By the foolishness of preaching. Preaching what? Paul said, preach the word. 
preach the word, the whole counsel of God. Preach that whole book. Preach it. Preach it. We, we have evangelists come to our churches. They preach some sermon that they felt God laid on their heart, preaching out of the King James Bible. What do they do? Give an invitation at the end. What happens? People come down, they want to be saved. And so that's what that's talking about. And so what is the earnest of our inheritance? It's the Holy Spirit of promise. What are those promises? God gives us eternal life. It's in his word. And so, I, and I'm not trying to make this complicated, but the question is, are these people saved? Again, there was a time when I didn't read the King James. I didn't believe it. But did had God saved me? Well, the Bible says I was saved from the foundation of the world. But God knew in his long suffering with me during that time, God knew that there was going to come a time when he was going to lead me to the green pasture of believing every word that he said. And I submitted to that, and God knew it. It wasn't blowing God's away going, Whew, it worked with Hoggard. I can't believe, I mean, I tried it. I, it worked with Hoggard. God wasn't doing that. He was going, yeah, I knew that. So what is the outcome of these people? Let me, let me give you another verse here. Let's go to, here we go, we're fixing to get in trouble. Let's go to 1 Peter. Let's look at, we're going to look at verse 23, but the rule is let's walk circumspectly. Let's go to... Um, Oh, let's see here. Oh, let's back. Let's back. Oh, my. I see. I did it again. I keep going. I keep hitting the wrong button, and I'm going. There we go. Right here. First Peter chapter 1. Maybe I'll stop doing that here in a minute. All right. Let's go up to verse 10 so we can get the context of it. Oh, let, you know, let's go back to verse 9. Receiving. Watch this the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. What does that teach us? It teaches us that salvation faith has a beginning and an end. And I'm going to directly challenge a... It had to be one of the most, one of the most obscene statements that I have ever seen in my life from someone. They said that they believed that a person who starts believing, goes down the altar, pops out a little prayer, God gives them salvation, they can even go after that and become an unbeliever, and they're still going to go to heaven when they die. That is not, not what the Bible says. There is, I don't care if, I don't care how you rightly divide or deduct from the Bible. There is no verse anywhere in the scriptures that says an unbeliever gets to go to heaven. It doesn't exist. It's not in Isaiah. It's not in Jeremiah. It's not in Genesis. It's not in Peter. It's not in any of Paul's writings. It does not exist anywhere. But the, Pope said. the Pope said. Let's go back to this. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. There's my point while ago when I was talking about how you can preach the word and see the salvation that God had. You can preach Moses and see the salvation of God. You can preach Noah and see the salvation of God. You can preach Jeremiah and see the salvation of God. It's the common, Jude called it the common salvation. He did not, you will not see a verse anywhere in the Bible that says there are more than one way 
two or three or four or five, for people to be saved and have eternal life doesn't exist anywhere. You say, well, yeah, what about Noah? He was saved by works, wasn't he? No. No. Mm -mm. Noah was saved by grace through faith. Let's quote scripture. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord before God ever told him to go build an ark. Noah had already found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God had already saved him even before the flood ever came. So then God goes to Noah, tells him what he wants him to do. What does Noah do? Does Noah believe what God said? Yeah. Because Noah believed. You don't, you don't believe me? Hebrews 11. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. How was Noah saved? By grace, through faith. It's the same gospel, people. It's the common salvation. Back to the scriptures. So, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Same grace. That's what they were talking about in the Old Testament. He then says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ. Now, this is uh, something that I've had people say. They said, well, in the Old Testament, they had the Spirit on them, but they didn't have it in them. Well, that's not what this says. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported to you by them. Let's see if I can scroll this down here. Uh, let's see here. The ministry which is now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, that means don't be drunk, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he hath which called he which hath called you as holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, you see that right there? Ask the question, does God respect persons? The answer is no. Past the time of your sojourning here of fear, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with what? Corruptible things such as silver, gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, by whom... Uh, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified yourselves in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfading love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the question is, all these people that you go to church with, and they're using all these other Bibles. Ask the question, is it corruptible or incorruptible? Ask them. Ask them the question, do you believe the Bible has mistakes in it? Ask them the question. You ask me. You ask me if my Bible has mistakes in it? No. No, it doesn't. My Bible doesn't have any mistakes in it. It doesn't have any errors in it. 
It's got a few rips in the pages, a little coffee stain there in 1 Thessalonians. But beyond that, it has no errors in the text of it. It's completely free of corruption. That's what I was born again with. And so, again, I don't know the hearts of other people, and I don't know their future and their outcome. Only God knows that. But I know that I have the seal of God, the earnest of the inheritance, which is the word of God. I know that. So I can say it for me. I know my Bible's right. I know it's 100% accurate. And I know that when my transformation comes and I am transformed from this body to the next one, I know that it will be because of the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. Oh, let's see here. It's liable to get interesting around here. All right, so let's, let's see here. Looking for... Somebody wrote in, ah, ah, okay. He said, you asked me to send another email. How can I be of service? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to remember that. All right. Here is somebody named Reg. Says, Dear Pastor Mike, as far as I've been able to tell, the only verse in the King James Bible that commands us to study and rightly divide Scripture is 2 Timothy 2.15. People desiring spiritual truth can only get truth is through a diligent search of the Scriptures. Now he quotes John 5.39, which says, by the way, if you uh, send me things with Scripture in it, send me the, the Scriptures, okay? Because uh, then I got to look it up like this. I got to stop what I'm doing and look it up. Genesis 5:39, or excuse me, John 5:39. Search the scripture, scriptures, or as it's the the original Hebrew of that is scripture im. Okay, that's a Hebrew joke. Uh, Hebrews add the letters I M to show plurality, like Elohim. Okay, Nephilim. So search the scripture, Im. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. I ask the question here. Did Jesus here tell us to search all of the scriptures or just a little piece of them? That's the question I, I I'm asking. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm not being uh, I'm not being like an ignorant person just to be smart off to everybody. The question that I have is, since it has been brought up to me that I am not rightly dividing. Um, who sends this email here? You you make an excellent point, Reg. Jesus, our our Lord, my Master, who I serve told me to search the scriptures. But he did not tell me here that I was to exclude some of them. He did not tell me that. So that's that's my question. If you say that I'm not rightly dividing, I would need the scriptures that show me that I broke the rules. And keep reading. The King James Bible contains no contradictions. Amen. So one should allow the Bible to interpret itself naturally. Don't make it say whatever you want it to say because no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. 2 Peter 1.20 Simply put, one should continually search the Scriptures for answers. Acts 17.11 Okay, here we go again. We've got to look that up. I'm just kidding. I'm just fooling with you. Acts, I think I already know what it is. Acts 17, 11. And the, Acts 17, 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who came thither and went into the synagogue of the Jews. 
these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched. What did they search? What did the Bereans search to find out whether what Paul and Silas was telling them was true or not? What did they search? Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. That's what they searched. That's what they had. That's where they got their doctrine from. And you say, well, that's impossible because it was the Old Testament and that was written under the law and they didn't have the Holy Spirit. That's not what Peter said. Peter said that when Moses was writing all this stuff down, the Spirit of Christ was in him. When David was writing his stuff, Christ was in him. Solomon, Christ was in him. I, the, whoever Ecclesiastes is, I never did find out who's, who that was. I'm not that stupid. Jeremiah, or Jeremiah writing Lamentations. The Spirit of Christ was in him. And the Spirit of Christ was giving all the words that those guys were to write down. So when the Bereans were searching to find out whether or not what Paul was telling them was true, they had to go back and read Jeremiah to find it out. And they did. That's what, that's what it means to be a Berean. Uh, good email. Appreciate you sending that one. Uh, let's see here. Christina says, Lynette, quit hiding behind the mic. I'm, just, I'm watching today. I'm, I'm watching the Extra Live show. There. How's that? <laughs> there we go. Nope. Nope. All right. Uh, let's see here. Sue says, thank you, Pastor Mike, for helping me to learn the, more of my KJB. I don't understand if I'm reading past or future context in many areas, such as in Isaiah or Revelation. Hope you can give me some direction. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Let's, let's, um, uh, let me tell you, uh, now, the, all of the scholars in the commentaries, they all say that here is how you do, I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to, let's go over here. Let's look at, oh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Uh, once, yea, twice. Let's type that in. Okay. Job 33, 14. For God, ah, why do, it, why do I do that all the time? For God speaketh once, yea, twice. All right. Now, there is a supplementary verse to that. Twice have I. Don't you just love having software? For God speaketh once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. So we're looking at some rules here, all right? Let's type in which was, and there's a reason why I'm doing this, okay? There is a place in Ecclesiastes. Who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon did. How did he write it? The Spirit of Christ was in him as he wrote it. Solomon said, Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There, okay, so the Bible's telling you, or verse 9, That thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. So, I mean, I could simplify the answer here and just tell you, the answer, you ask me the question, I don't understand if I'm reading past or future context. The answer is, yes, you are. Okay? Um, you're reading it. It was prophesied before it happened, but then it happened. Or part of it did. Let's use the analogy of Acts chapter 2. Paul gets up, and he's quoting... Joel, and it was Paul, or excuse me, Peter. Peter that said, um, this 
is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And you go, oh, okay. So it was fulfilled, right? Not so fast. You go back and read Joel. And Peter quoted the whole context of Joel. And he said, you know, the sun should be dark and the moon should be turned to blood and the powers of the heaven should be shaken and before that great and notable day of the Lord. The prob- was the Holy Spirit poured out then? Yeah. Was the sun darkened? No. The moon turned to blood? No. The stars from heaven fall? No. What happened? Go back and read Joel again. Because, Sue, that which was is that which shall be. So there was a partial fulfillment on the day of Pentecost. There's going to be a perfect fulfillment in the last days. So if you're asking, well, did it already happen? Yeah. Is it going to happen again? Yeah. All right. That's, and that's the Bible telling you that that's how it works. God speaketh once, yea, twice. Christ is the spoken word. He comes the first time, partial fulfillment. He comes the second time, perfect fulfillment. So then you can go back and, and read any prophecy of the Old Testament and see, yes, it had a partial fulfillment. Even, let's go back to... Um, when there was uh, weeping, uh, Ra- uh, Rachel weeping for her children. You remember that one? That was in the, when Herod was having all the babies killed. But go back. You'll find that in Jeremiah. Go back and read that. There were things that Jeremiah said were going to happen in conjunction with that that did not happen the way God said they were going to happen. What does that mean? The, full, the future perfect fulfillment has yet to come down the line. So as you're reading these prophecies, think once, yea, twice. Think, I know this already happened again, and that gives me delight because now I believe that God is going to do it yet again. And you take that theme and just run it all through. the. Script. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, let's see here. Daniel, he says, and you know what, Daniel, I like you because you, you, you sent scripture. Uh, the, the previous email that Daniel sent, he said, could you explain how you interpret scripture? Sometimes I have a really hard time following you as you take common words such as a fiery trial and tr- then try to connect them to another part of the Bible, which seems to be out of the context of its original meaning, and then create a biblical interpretation. I'm not trying to attack or insult you, but in biblical interpretation, you must take a verse literally, unless the context shows it to be figurative. Otherwise, one can be open to all kinds of errors. So here's what we're going to do, Dan. You sent the you sent the verse, First Peter one six, and I'm I'm going to read I'm going to read the verse on here, and I'm going to read what you wrote, okay? And then I'm going to go back to First Peter, and we're going to walk circumspectly around that verse to see why I would have said what I said. All right, and, and I'm following you here, okay? And you make a good point. First Peter 1, and, and by the way, this is how it should be done. I've, I've had offers. I've had um, provocations for people to come and debate me, like on this show, okay? Not going to do it. I'm not a debater. If you are like Daniel, and this is how you see it, and you have a question concerning what I said and, and why I said it, then you do it. Then you do it Daniel's way. You say, Pastor, this is here's the scripture. This is, and I'm looking at this word here, and I think it means exactly what it says. And I'm going to respond, but I'm not going to say, Well, let's just agree to disagree. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, You know what? You got a point here. I'm going to look at the scripture. So let's let me let me do this. All right. Um, he said this should be part of the email below. First Peter one six. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, 
ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, here's what he says. The word now, quotation marks, is in this verse which shows it in present tense, not a future book, not a future book of Revelation trial. He quotes scripture. I love it. All right. Here's what I'm going to do. Let's go back and look at 1 Peter 1. Uh, let me do that. Let me pull up the 1 Peter. Okay. Now, here's, here's my immediate response. Okay. Let's look. Here's verse 6. This is what you quoted. Let's go up to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten who? Us. Again, unto a lively hope by the resurrection. Did this apply to those in Peter's day? Yep. Does it not also apply to us now? Yes. Hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. Does that apply to us? Yes. Did it apply to them? Yes. Reserved when? In the future. Future, future, future. Reserved in heaven for you. It's waiting for us up there. For you who are kept by the power of God, how? Through faith unto salvation. Now, I'm, I'm going to say something. I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to say something. Because some, some people have, have uh, I mean, they've climbed all over me. I even, I, I've got a chart that somebody made up that showed, okay, during the age of grace, during the Gentile church age, men are saved by grace alone through faith. During the seven years, Israel is going to be saved by works plus grace. I kid you not. I'll find it and show it to you. That's what they said. Because they said that there is a different gospel now than what poor Israel gets. Poor Israel stinks to be the Jew who God is going to make them be saved by working, by law-keeping, plus grace. Let me tell you something. There is no verse in the Bible that says grace is ever accompanied or must be accompanied by works. Paul actually said, if it's by works, it's not by grace. So I don't believe it. I don't believe it for a second. I don't know who made that up, but it's not in the Bible. But then this same group says, Hoggard, you idiot, you cannot get any of your salvation doctrine from 1 Peter, because 1 Peter was not written to us. It was written to the Jews in the future, 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 future. You going to stick with that one? You going to stick with it? Because if that's true, then Peter said that which, had, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Peter said that salvation was through faith. Ready to now. Here is the point that I'm going to make with you. Uh, who wrote the email? Daniel. Here's the point I'm going to make with you. It says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So, the context, even though you see the word now, according to the rules, and, and actually, um, I'm going to pull your email up again. Your email said that um, you, you try to connect them. I, I, let's see here. But in biblical interpretation, you must take a verse literally unless the context shows it to be figurative or other. And I'm, what I'm doing is I am dealing with the context of the particular verse that you brought up. 
Okay, and and again, I, I, I am not in any way trying to be disrespectful to you. Okay, uh, but I'm answering. I'm giving an answer to the question that you sent to me. So the verse before the word now says that it's ready to be revealed in the last time. So that is a future event. So he says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, we are greatly rejoicing, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that now I'm going to show you, we saw both before this word now, that it is about, not just right now, but also the last time. Then I'm going to show you verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory when? Not now. At the appearing of Jesus Christ. So, whom having not seen, you love, in whom though now though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with un- joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So, is the word now for like right this second only? Well, it is for right now, and it was for right now then. But both before and after, in a circle around that phrase, both verses before and after talked about a time to come. Then, since we really cannot isolate one verse out of the whole counsel of God, when you continue to read 1 Peter, you clearly get the idea that, number one, it does apply for things that happen right now. But there are repeated statements throughout 1 Peter that tell us it is for a time to come, a perfect fulfillment of everything that God said. Dan, you did well. I greatly appreciate your email. I I honestly hope that I answer your question, and I do see where you're coming from. I do see where you're coming from. But as I apply the biblical rules of exegesis and interpretation, I'm looking at the circle around that verse, and it does talk about something in the future, 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 future. Uh, Let's see here. Oh, let me deal with this one. Jeremy says, Pastor Mike. I've heard that drugs, not drudge, drugs, can be compared to sorcery in the Bible. I'm not seeing the connection. Can you help me to understand this unless those people are wrong? Now, uh, Jeremy, what I'd like to do is I'd like to pretend that I don't know what you're talking about, but I have an idea. I know what you're talking about. I gotta turn my heat pad back on. Because I have a lot, a lot of arthritis pain. And so I sit on a heating pad all day long and nobody here. I take things for it. I do. Okay have to. Um, My diabetes is a progressive disease. I have tried uh, naturopathic remedies. They were not working. So I have worked with diet alone since June. Because after the first week of taking, uh, it was a combination medicine they were giving me. And it was, you should have seen it. It was making me dry heave. I was going, like that. And I'm going, what is wrong with me? 
And I, my doctor said, I think it's the medicine. <laughs> okay, well, let's cut that out. And I started working on diet. And so for the most part, uh, diet has been keeping my blood sugar down. But I've noticed in the last couple weeks spikes in my blood sugar and I'm going what did I eat I don't know what I ate so I have a prescription for metformin that's the standard drug that's given all right uh, that's you take metformin until you just can't control it anymore then you have to start taking insulin uh, and if I don't I'll die I mean it is that I, it is, this is not a very difficult decision for me. If I don't, I might die. So that's what I do. So I am starting to, I haven't been taking the metformin very much at all. But in the last two weeks, I've had to throw some in there. My doctor, I trust him. Okay. He's a good guy. He's got his head on straight. Um, he said, Mike, you're in the honeymoon. It's a progressive disease. And I know this to be true because I saw the progress that it took in my dad. Now, I happen to know what you might be talking about because there's, there's somebody out there. In fact, there's quite a few people out there. One in particular I know of. I'm going to mention his name. I have heard him say that if you take prescription medicines or things like that, and I am, I hope I'm not taking him out of context. I don't mean to mischaracterize what he said. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But he put forth the idea that if you take certain pharmaceuticals, you will have devils in you. I heard him say that. And what he did was he went to the book of Revelation Scratch that. What he did was he went to a Greek language Bible that he cannot read nor understand. And he read a word in there from the book of Revelation that looked like it was talking about pharmaceuticals. And then he made the statement or the general tone of what he said was, you take this stuff, it's witchcraft, it's sorcery. If you just read this English Bible, you will not see that. Or I, I will say, I have not seen that yet. I may be wrong. I don't know every verse in the Bible. I have not seen that. Does that mean that I'm saying that whatever the doctor gives you, you should take? No, I'm not that dumb. Am I? No, I'm not that dumb. And I think that you should inquire diligently of the leadership of the Holy Ghost in it. But to make the statement, that pharmaceutical drugs, as a blanket statement, that all of them are witchcraft, that's wrong. The answer is, biblically, the answer is no. Let me quote scripture, because I love to quote scripture. Here's a verse. Let's see here. Where is it? Where, 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 where? Uh, ah, here we go. Let me pull it up here. Let me show you what I'm looking at. Proverbs 17:22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Who wrote that? The Holy Ghost did. The Holy Ghost in the Bible does not say that medicine is evil. 
Let's look at another verse. A P O T H E. Here we go. There were, let me show you the screen here. There were apothecaries that were good at making ointments and balms and things like that. And God said to Moses, when you make the holy oil, um, it should be an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. Uh, he said it here in verse 35. Uh, Exodus 37, 29, according to the work of the apothecary. Um, here, Second Chronicles. Uh, let's see here. They had spices. This is uh, Asa. Let's see here. I'm just looking at the word apothecary or apothecaries. Uh, let's see here. Ecclesiastes 10, 1. Dead flies cause the appointment of the or the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth the little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. I like how Gail Ripplinger uses that verse to talk about these scholars who are ruining the Bible. And she sees the analogy between the ointment of the apothecary and the balm of the word of God healing us. And she says, you know, when you got dead flies in your ointment, it stinks. It makes it stink. So then when you get up and read your King James and then you say, now the original translation of this is, that's a dead fly in the ointment. Jesus, let me just give you this. When Jesus found the woman, who touched the hem of his garment. The Bible says that this woman, for 12 years, spent everything that she had on doctors. So she had been from one doctor to another, to another, to another. Did they do her any good? Well, apparently not. When she goes to Jesus, did Jesus say, how dare you? You didn't trust me. You went to all the doctors. I'm not healing you. It's not what he said. He never, never berated her because she went to doctors first. Never did. She used Jesus as a last resort, and you know what? He didn't get mad at her for it. Now, again, I am not endorsing... I know probably not as much as some of you have or think you know. I know there is an agenda in the whole health care. Uh, Obamacare is mark of the beast stuff. I get it. The whole idea behind the mark of the beast is to give people immortality in the flesh. I get it. So is the New World Order... Does it encompass the healthcare system of this world? Oh, yeah, especially when these drug companies and all these stuff, they're putting gods and goddesses and stuff like that in their names. Okay? I get it. Oh, I get it. I look at the symbols and I'm going, yeah, I know what that's about. Does that mean that taking this particular pill for, let's say, arthritis or high blood pressure or cholesterol or this or that, is that the mark of the beast? Is that sorcery? And the answer is no. Doesn't mean that. Is there going to be something coming down the road that's going to lead to that? There's no doubt in my mind about it. And you know what I believe? The Lord knoweth them that are his. He will keep us. I believe it. By the way, what did Christ promise would happen in the book of Mark. You drink poison, it won't kill you. You get snake bit, it won't hurt you. That's what he promised. And I believe God is I believe God is going to keep his people. Again, I'm not a doctor and I I don't think I have the right. I don't have the right scripturally, I don't have the right legally 
to tell you not to take certain medicines or to go see a doctor. I don't have that right. I don't have it biblically, and I don't have it legally. Uh, so I could, I could never do that. Um, let's see here. Who else? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm looking for email. Let's see. No, 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 no. Hi, Pastor Mike. Boy, this is little bitty writing. There are things said in the Bible about women that are really hard to comprehend and not be offended by. 1 Timothy 2.15 is one of these verses. Can you please help me to understand how a woman is saved in childbearing? And I like you because you actually quoted the scripture. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, one of the things I don't have is I don't have this absolute wonderful wisdom on this particular verse. However, I actually read this verse wrong on this program one time because I thought I knew what it said, and I thought that it said she shall be saved through childbearing. And someone corrected me. They said, Pastor Mike, doesn't say through childbearing. It says in childbearing. I went, oh. Um, I think it has something to do with the curse in Genesis 3 um, that uh, a woman will go through pain and suffering uh, in the course of childbearing. Um, but beyond that, I don't know. I mean, I have an idea that it's related to John 16. Okay? Uh, and so here's what I want you to do, uh, Lauren. I want you to go read John 16 and find the part in there about a woman having a baby. All right? And I think that there is a correlation between John 16 and 1 Timothy 2.15. So you go do it and ask the Holy Ghost. All right? Uh, and I don't want you to be offended by what God said. Okay? And the best way to do that, great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. If you, and Lauren, I'm not judging you, because I don't know you. If you would love and learn to love everything that God said, what he said to you would not offend you anymore, all right? If you would just, if you would love what God said and know that God has your interest in mind better than you do, all right? Just kind of run with that. And uh, see what happens here. Uh, da -da, da -da, da -da, let's see here. I'm looking for uh, rightly dividing. Karen says, Dear Pastor Mike, rightly dividing the truth between the purpose of the law and the purpose of grace. That's all I got. Oh, I like what you said. Rightly dividing the truth between the purpose of the law, which was the promise. It's typology. It's a, the Paul uh, in Hebrews said it's a shadow of things to come, shadow of good things, all right? Uh, and the purpose of grace, fulfillment. I like it. I like it. Let's see here. No, 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 no. Rightly dividing. Ed, uh, do you think there's a difference between being saved in being regenerated, no, because one is the other. One, so you're not, let me explain how the Bible uses the term salvation. This was something that, uh, that I struggled with over the years. Because, you know, somebody goes down the altar, they say the prayer, we say, they're saved. They're saved, I saw them, they got saved. And we, we use that terminology for them. When you look at the scriptures and you look at every, and I did this, I looked at every place in the Bible where it talked about saved, salvation, saviors, everything. I made notes. I, I made extensive notes. I put them all in categories. And I came to the conclusion that it's not salvation if it didn't actually save them. 
Let me give you an instance. Noah was saved from the flood, wasn't he? Sure he was. He was saved um, even though he had the promise of it before the flood. If, if, if we were to look back and, and let's say there was an alternate universe where Noah forgot to put the plug in the ark at the bottom, and as the rains came down, the flood, the ark just went bloop. Uh-oh, what happened? What happened? Oh, here we go. All right. Whew, scared me for a minute. And, and the rains came down and the floods came up and the ark just stayed there and everybody in it drowned. We would not say, number one, that they were saved. Number two, we wouldn't say that they lost salvation. They didn't get saved. It didn't work. They died. They perished in the flood. That is not, that's not God's idea of salvation. If it is, that really stinks. <clears throat> and I use this analogy. My dad, uh, he worked on the Mississippi River. Lynette, you need to go in my office and see all those pictures. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> he worked on the Mississippi River. And, uh, <clears throat> I went up, used to go on the boat with him all the time. Big, big, massive government dredge boat. Stay with him for a few days. <clears throat> a boat would come from the middle of the river, the dredge, would come over and pick us up, <clears throat> take us over there. And uh, <clears throat> one time we were in January, ice floating down the Mississippi River. And as we got on this little pontoon barge, Dad said, don't fall in there. If you fall in that water, you've got 30 seconds to live. And after that, you're dead. Whew. I took him seriously. So let's say, let's say that I fell in. And my dad is trying to reach down to grab a hold of me. What is he wanting to do? Save me or I'm going to perish. And he reaches down to grab me, and he says, stick your hand out here. And I don't do it. I keep saying, Dad, save me, save me. And he sticks his hand out, and I don't reach out and take his hand. And I just die in the river. Did he save me? No. We wouldn't say, well, he saved him, but it didn't work. We wouldn't say that. The term, and I'm just telling you, go through the whole Bible and look at every occurrence of save, Savior, salvation, saved, everything. The, and the Bible says he saved them with a mighty salvation. And it was always in retrospect of what God actually performed in them, the fact that they went from being dead or being nearly dead, and now they're in life. That's salvation. The regeneration is when you and I will, this body will be dissolved, and what's growing on the inside of us, that hope, that promise, that, that Christ being formed in us, what Paul said, actually comes to fruition. That's the regeneration. So salvation and regeneration are the same thing. Um, and Ed says, I think Orthodox Reformed theology is that regeneration precedes salvation. I think they go hand in hand here, okay? Um, so, and I'm not very big or familiar with Reformed, uh, Re Orthodox Reformed theology. I'm not, I'm not big on it. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't read it in the scripture. So anyway, uh, let's see here. Rightly dividing. That was written in Chinese. That's interesting. Uh, Darlene says, don't know if you got this or not on Tuesday, so here it goes again. 
You've talked about the last Trump slash trumpet. I can't find the first Trump slash trumpet. Can you help? Thank you. And hi, Lynette. That was Darlene, by the way. All right. Two schools of thought. Okay. And both schools, both people who sit in both schools, both of them see through a glass darkly. Don't let any, oh, please, please don't let anybody make you think that they, in fact, have all the true answers. Don't think it. The Bible does not say that one person or this group has all of the true answers. Because there are some people out there who say, well, of course we're telling you the truth and everything that we say is the truth, and if you don't believe us, you're a heretic. They do. Oh, they're bad about it, too. Two schools of thought, and we both see through a glass darkly. First school of thought. The first trumpet, Revelation chapter 1, John said, I heard a voice behind me as of a trumpet. They said that's the first one. They say the last one is Revelation chapter 4. I heard that the voice of which I heard sounded like a trumpet saying, come up hither. They say that's the last one. Okay, that's, I mean, that's scripture. Okay, I get it. There are some who say that the first trumpet is Revelation 8. Um, let's see here. 8. Uh, the, 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 and 8, 7. The first angel sound, and there followed a hail and fire mingled with blood. Okay? They say that was the first trumpet. And then, of course, the last trumpet will be the seventh trumpet. What do I believe? I tend to lean toward the seventh trumpet as the last one. Because truly, you don't see any more trumpets after that. You don't see it. So that's, that's when I'm looking through the glass darkly, that's what I'm seeing. All right? And the other group, who I have a lot more respect for them than some of them have for me, the other group, who is also looking through a glass darkly, says it's Revelation 1 and Revelation 4. Okay? At least they're using the King James Bible. All right? So I'm cool with it. Somebody writes and says, I ask you about great questions I have, and I'm sure others wonder a lot of the same things. Please consider dealing with some of my questions. I know that they could cause contentions, but they are real questions. Thanks. Uh, I'm looking for your email, and I don't see it. Maybe I'm wrong. So... Send it to me again. I'll take a look at it, all right? Let's see here. Barb. Barb wrote in. Should I read it? She's got real little handwriting here. Do you think those who are not rightly dividing the word are using the newage versions, therefore being confused anyway because it is not the truth? God is not a God of confusion, and what he said in the Old Testament, he aligns in the New Testament, correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, and then her writing gets real little tiny. I think, th I think this is a contract she's wanting me to sign. Mm -hmm. The Word of God never contradicts itself, meaning the Old and New Testament. God is a God of order. In addition, the Old foreshadows the New. The Old foreshadows Christ. I also think of a straight line when dividing something. So if you think of the Word of God being rightly divided, I think it is being correctly divided or straight. I think of the scripture, Isaiah 40, verse 4, Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight. Not, Barb, not bad. Not bad. Uh, let's see here. Furthermore, we should look at the word circumspectly, as PM would say. That means post-meridian. 
Uh, look at what is said before and after verse. It would be like reading the middle of a. Let's see. Let me make sure I follow this. It would be. I need. I need one of those things those Jewish rabbis do when they're reading the Torahs. Okay. It would be like reading the middle of a paragraph in a letter and saying you understand what is being said. The headings on each chapter were added. We need to read the whole book. 2 Timothy 2.11. It is faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we all shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Oh, I get it. And their word will eat as doth a canker. That's cancer. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standing sure, standeth sure having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Does this make sense? Does it make sense? That was you, by the way. Yeah, it does. Okay. Lorian, I know who you are. Okay. And I appreciate you writing in. Uh, Peter says it was written to those who are scattered. Then you add the Jews. You added the word the Jews. That's what you added. That's the Jews then, and now and future. Peter was the apostle to the Jews. Paul is our apostle. Stop right here. I want to ask you a question, Lorian. Who was the first apostle to preach the gospel to the Gentiles? Who was it? Do you know? It was Peter. It was Peter, not Paul. It was Peter who God sent first to the Gentiles, not Paul. So if, if, you want to, if you want to do this thing where you say anything that Peter says cannot be to the Gentiles, number one, you have no scripture that says that. There is, and, and I'm just, I'm wondering why when you said that Peter was the apostle to the Jews, and why you said Peter was only written to the Jews, why you didn't put a verse in here? That's, what I'm, that's my question. That's been, to be honest with you, that's been my question all along. Is that I've had this statement thrown at me 20 times, and no one has ever quoted a scripture to back it up. When the truth of it is, it was Peter who first preached to the Gentiles. And then, let me show you what Paul said our faith was built upon. Let me show you from what Paul said. So let me switch the screen. Sweep this with the besom of destruction. Let's type in that word apostles, plural. Let's look... Let's see here. Let's go to, and if you think I'm just scanning through this to cover it up, you're wrong. You go read it for yourself. See, that's what I tell everybody to do, and some people have a problem with that. I'm not saying, Lori, and you do. I'm saying some people have a problem with it. Uh, let's see here. That's uh, not note among the, the apostles who also were in Christ before me. What? The other apostles were in Christ before Paul. God set forth set forth us, the apostles. He didn't distinct himself as separate from them. Um, he set forth the apostles, are all apostles, is what it says here. After that, we've seen of James and all of the apostles. Uh, Paul said, I'm the least of the apostle, apostles. Uh, let's see here. Where, where am I looking for here? Uh, okay, Ephesians 2.20. I think it was Paul who wrote Ephesians 2. Uh, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, plural, and prophets, which means the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
It says down here in Ephesians 3, 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto Paul. Oh, no, that's not what it says. It says it's now revealed unto his holy apostles, the plural ones, not the singular ones. And so I, I'm just... I'm just curious as to why, when you tell me that Peter is only for the Jews, why you don't quote Scripture to tell me that? Because, Lorian, God is always true and every man is a liar. That would be me, and that would be her. You just take it from there. And so I, I have, I won't receive anything from anybody without scriptures. Give me three. Okay? First witness, second witness, and then throw a third one in there just for good measure. But there is no scripture anywhere that tells me that Peter cannot be read and understood for doctrine. Or that, and I'll be honest. Lorian, maybe you didn't say this, but some people that you have been in contact with have made the statement that we as the Gentiles should only read Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, not Hebrews, not James, not 1st, 2nd Peter, not Revelation, and not Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Acts. Why? Paul never said that. Paul said all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, all of it. Because one of the premises that I have been told by some people was that I can't use all Scripture for doctrine. That it'll, it'll contradict itself if you use all of it. It'll contradict itself. Do you believe that? No. I don't believe that either. That you know why I don't believe it? I don't have a verse that tells me to believe that some Scriptures will contradict others unless I take it out. And so, Lorraine, I appreciate you writing in. If you have a better argument, send it. But if you want to get in my head with why I am not allowed to teach out of Peter, bring scriptures. But there are none. I haven't seen it. So you can be mad at me all you want to, and all the people now that are really going to jump on this are really ticked off at me because I taught out of 1 Peter. Too bad, because I'm not going to stop. I'm going to teach out of Revelation and Matthew and 1 Peter and Hebrews until the Lord comes. And Psalms and Genesis and Leviticus and Jeremiah. Send me scripture, Lorian, okay? You do that, and I'll be looking forward to it. I love you guys. Read your Bible. Read, read, read the whole thing. I dare you. I dare you to read the whole Bible. Here a little, there a little if you want to, all right? God bless you.